Hello, this is Mark Holmes bringing, uh, bringing you another Via Satellite Thursday morning conversation. And this time we're going all the way to California again. And we have Mark Dankberg, the chairman and CEO of, of Viasat joining us. Uh, Mark, welcome to the Thursday morning conversation. And tell us a little bit about life in lockdown for the, for the Dankberg family. Okay. Uh, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, good to be here. Um, you know, this lockdown thing is it's mostly very weird. You know, it's, uh, I think it's a little bit easier for me than it is for my wife because, because I'm busy. You know, I'm, uh, I'm doing stuff uh, at work and my wife is a little bit uh, driving crazy. But, uh, you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff from, work, from home, uh, just like most people. And we've been asking everybody because we've been at home with our families about what, what movies uh, uh, or TV dramas that, that we've been watching. So uh, any recommendations or good movies or good dramas that you'd recommend to the satellite community? Well, uh, no, actually, normally I don't watch very much TV or that many movies, but probably have seen more in the last <laughs> three months than I have in the last three years, I bet. Yeah. Uh, but... I don't know. I mean, one of the first things I did is I watched all of the Silicon Valley <laughs> on, on HBO, uh, which is, you know, I mean, remember I started the company. I mean, I've been through, you know, startups and uh, we're not in the Silicon Valley, but it's pretty amazing how, how uh, true to life part of that, that was. Watched Michael Jordan and Last Dance. Okay. Uh, not, not a whole lot of other TV shows. A few movies. Uh, what was your favorite movie that you watched recently? Probably the one that surprised me the most. I, th I thought it was really good. It was one called Logan Lucky. It's a fairly recent movie. Uh, I think it's a Steven Soderbergh movie. It's, it, was, it was really good. It was funny and pretty pretty clever. I don't know that one. What was it? What's that one about? Uh, it's about. Uh, it's kind of about. Um, uh, so, I mean, I use the term like hillbillies in, in uh, West Virginia who <laughs> come up with this very elaborate heist, you know, to steal money out of a NASCAR track. It's, uh, it's, actually, it's, it's, it's really quite well done. It's got Daniel Craig in it and uh, a few other pretty well-known stars. I think, you know, it's the same director that did Ocean's Eleven and he's done other similar types of heist movies. This one, the context was... It was pretty interesting. It was, it was really pretty funny. It was su surprisingly good. And I'd never heard of it, you know. Part of it is just trying to find movies to watch, you know. And, and how have you been enjoying that? Because obviously it's a big change. You said you've watched more movies and TV in the last three months than you have in the, you know, last few years. How are you, how are you, in, are you enjoying the change? Are you, you know, having something a little bit different to your routine? Uh, you know, normally I think what I, I'd be watching sports. So no live sports is a you know, that's kind of painful for me. I really like sports. I, I, th I think I'm a little bit of a cultural Neanderthal uh, compared to <laughs> some of your other guests, but uh, I really like sports. And and also I would be otherwise I'd be probably at the gym in the evening or doing something else. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's definitely given me a chance to uh, explore video on demand more. I, uh, you know, without live sports uh, i almost don't watch anything on you know on linear tv anymore so i've i've explored more of the video on demand world so i mean i'm a sports fan myself um so i have to ask uh, as a big sports fan like your favorite sports and which teams perhaps do you you follow the most oh uh you know baseball basketball golf probably are my main ones okay. baseball San Diego Padres. I mean, it's a, it definitely is a uh, exercise in humility <laughs> there, <laughs> but it's fun. I like baseball, and then uh, uh, basketball. Grew up in LA. I really, still like the Lakers. Uh, and boy, for the first year in like seven years, they've been competitive. Uh, so that that's good. And then I, and I, I like watching golf. I like. Mostly, I like to watch sports that I play or try to play. Anyway, so you're a basketball player. <laughs> I was. <laughs> that, that, uh, I used to be. Uh, okay. And uh, well, 
I mean, everything's relative. I wasn't a, I wasn't a very good basketball player, but I really like it. Excellent. Um, I, I'm more of a soccer and, and, and tennis player, and I'm a big um, Liverpool supporter. So, uh, you know, um, and I, I follow tennis as well. I, I like golf as well. I mean, I'm probably, if, I, if I'm a, a golf fan, I, I'm definitely probably a, a Rory McIlroy fan um, yeah. of uh, the European golfers. Uh, do you have a particular favourite amongst uh, golfers that you, you follow? Well, it's hard not, I mean, you just have to have great appreciation for Tiger Woods for oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, he's been around a while, and but there's lots of you know young, you know, really impressive young golfers. And Rory McIlroy, you know, I like him. I like to see Jordan Spieth come back and and uh, get in contention again. Uh, I think he's he's really good for the game. People like Tony Finau is also he's a really you know seems to be a really good guy. Uh, we like to see him. Get some more success. Do you see? Uh, I'll, I'll put you on the spot with a golfing question. Uh, um, I mean, Jordan Spieth and Rory McIlroy—they're both one slam away from getting the Grand Slam, winning all four Grand Slams. Uh -huh. Do you expect both of them to to do that? Uh, boy, yeah, I think Rory McIlroy is a very good bet. You know, Jordan <laughs> Spieth—I think he just uh, needs—he just needs to recover something and. Uh, and then he'll be, he can be really competitive. I mean, I think the thing about uh, Jordan Spieth, which is pretty interesting for, for me, really seems to enjoy what he does. He, you know, he likes, I think he really likes playing golf. And I think that's a, that's a strength. Uh, but boy, you know, it's so competitive. <laughs> and, uh, Many great players. Amazing. You know, it's, to me, it's a little bit amazing that, uh, you know, that, that, that a handful of golfers have been as successful as they have been. Uh, you know, it's actually one of the things I always think about in any competition. You know, there's a saying about Tiger against the field, you know, and he's like one of the only guys that's ever really been really successful uh, over a long period of time against the field. It's just so competitive. It really is. And, you know, it's, you know, one in maybe a hundred chance winning a, a tournament. And, you know, even the... I guess the golfers ranked, you know, nearer a hundred than one are still incredibly good and can win a, on any given week. So it's a, and there seems to be more better golfers than ever, I guess, with more technology and, you know, swing coaches and, and things like that. So yeah. it's, it's a tough sport. Um, one of the things we've been asking all of our people on this call, we, we, we try and ask about music and what sort of music they like and, and listen to. We've had some very interesting uh, ones so far, uh, ones I didn't necessarily predict. So um, are you a music fan at all? Uh, favorite artists or what types of music do you like to listen to? Yeah, I do. So, yeah, I really do like music. I am... <laughs> I'm not going to come up with some off the wall, you know, or, uh, unknown band. I, I have pretty eclectic tastes. So, and I, I, you know, I went to college in Texas, so I still have this uh, country, you know, kind of country orientation. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Kenny Chesney, Mary Chapin Carpenter, Jimmy Buffett, Zach Brown. Those, those would be more. But, but uh, also, I really like uh, jazz, kind of old jazz. So Miles Davis. Modern jazz quartet, uh, like that. Hawaiian music. Uh, it's pretty eclectic, but uh, probably all various forms of more mainstream things, I'd say. I, I'm actually, uh, Mary Chapin Carpenter was one of my first um, oh. country artists that I really liked. Um, yeah. She started making a little bit of a splash in the UK in sort of the early 90s. And uh, I actually bought one or two of her albums and uh, saw her in concert in Cambridge. So I think she's a tremendous songwriter. I think oh, she yeah. did so yeah. um, really, it's sort of that, it's sort of like, to me, it like fused country and, and pop in a way and folk. It was, it was, it had a very contemporary sound that you, I think you probably see more like, like a Casey Musgraves now in terms of, um, you know, that sort of being able to bring, I guess country music beyond a country audience, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah, her lyrics are great, and also, you know, one of the things around advice that she's known for her business advice, which is uh, sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. You know, 
<laughs> what, what's your, before we talk about some work stuff, what, um, what's your favorite concert or concert you look back on and you think that was just a fantastic evening, one of the uh, best experiences? Is there one that you can highlight for us? Boy, probably, uh, you know, probably the most memorable is one of the, one of the few people I've seen multiple times is uh, Bruce Springsteen. And back in the, oh boy, it must have been in the late 70s, early 80s. So, he, you know, he was, was kind of before the Born in the USA stuff. Uh, but just the enthusiasm and intensity that he would bring to it is, you know, I, you know in a constructive way, I'd say, it was, you know, that was pretty memorable. Also, uh, my wife, who didn't, who wasn't a Bruce Springsteen fan when she went to the concert, she she was converted, you know, just because of just sincerity, genuineness, and energy, you know, and quality of the music is uh, that was pretty good. My dad is a huge Springsteen fan. He, he, he literally will not listen to anybody else now but Bruce Springsteen. So uh, I'm partly to blame because I, I got him into it in the the mid eighties. Um, what, what's your favorite Bruce song? I mean, there's so many, and it's, I know it's hard to pick one, but if you could pick one Bruce song, which one would you which one would you go for? Uh, well, it depends on uh, you know he's he's got you know, different songs for different emotions and moods. But probably the one I, I still like the best is probably Incident on 57th Street, you okay. know, because that was like just pure, that was just sort of root, you know, what he came from. And it was, uh, well, that and Rosalita, you know, on the same album, those two, I think, are quintessential sort of where he came from. Yeah, I would say my, my I'll I'll go in a slightly different direction with my Bruce song. I one of the songs I really really like was one off the Rising called Nothing Man, and yeah. that album in in response to nine eleven, it just had some beautiful storytelling. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I thought that album, I think that one and Tunnel of Love are my favorite bruce albums um uh, you know just the characters that he sort of brings to life in, in songs um you know are, are just fantastic i mean there's no one else who really does it the way he does it so no. you know yeah. I, i'd pick out those uh, i'd pick out those albums as uh, two of my favorites so let, let's go on to a bit of satellite stuff because we also okay. like to take the opportunity to uh, um sort of talk about um where we are as an industry and you know the fact that we're doing this people are working from home i mean viasat has a has a big global presence strong presence in in many verticals within the satellite industry um how, how have things been impacted um by sort of covid and and what have you been doing also as well to to make sure the company is up and running well and and keeping employees safe as well well wow. So there, there's a lot, a lot to unpack in there. You know, one, I think, just in terms of uh, operating the company and keeping things going, uh, we have really good team. We're very dispersed. You know, we have locations all around the U.S. and Europe and Asia, and uh, almost everywhere, people are working from home. You know, I think uh, over eighty percent of our employees are working remotely now. Really, the only ones that are working from offices or people that are involved in building things or integrating or testing systems, including the new satellite. So that's, we have a fair number of people in, uh, in our Tempe, Arizona office and in Atlanta and in Carlsbad that are working from the office that are in operations. I think uh, from a business and market perspective, the only market that's really been negatively impact for us is the in-flight market and you know the air travel has just been devastated and so that uh that slowed down um we're trying to you know work with our customers the best we can uh help help them get through it I mean, we're a small part of what their overall problems are but but that's a it's a factor and then uh uh, the rest, boy, you know, we have a lot more demand for residential internet. So that is the pe people that are already customers have more 
you know, they, they're, they're using it a lot more, which is creating more demand. And then also a lot more people need access that, uh, you know, we're, we're somehow getting by without access generally. That's kind of what we're seeing. Or they just had mobile wireless internet at home that is uh, not sufficient now. So, so we're working on that. Uh, you know, one of the main things that we're doing uh, is trying to prepare for what life will be like afterwards. You know, uh, so a lot, you know, trying to develop some new products and services, improve existing ones, work with new airlines, lots of interaction with the government. There's a lot of issues uh, there that we're helping with. So we're amazingly busy. Plus, there's also just been in the U.S. a lot of activity on the regulatory front. Uh, so uh, one, some new proceedings around space safety and orbital debris, which are very complicated, but I think hugely important to the space industry as a whole. Uh, there's another round of FCC broadband subsidies coming called, called RDOF, another processing round for non-geosynchronous satellites. All those things have been uh, real. I mean, they've taken a lot of... Uh, Effort on our part. And that, that's those were, that's one of the things that we've had to work almost completely remotely by WebEx and stuff like that. And I think that's gone gone pretty well. I mean, just on the mobility market, um, I think there was an a, an executive from Virgin Atlantic, Yuha Yarvanen, who said he, uh, he doesn't expect that market to come back until twenty twenty three. I mean, is that something that? You, is it going to be that long, do you think, before it gets back to sort of pre-COVID levels? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, everybody's got their own version of a crystal ball. You know, I, th I think, uh, the, you know, the main issue in travel is just going to be people's comfort level. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, I think I think having – a vaccine and effective treatments that, that'll certainly improve people's comfort levels. But one, you know, one thing that's been pretty striking to me, I'm kind of a big Disney fan, and one of the things I, you know, I've read about is, you know, Disney's opened their Shanghai Park uh, with lots of social distancing and new, you know, new precautionary measures. But I think one of the things I read was that. Uh, there had been no new cases of COVID in Shanghai for two months uh, at all. No, I mean, none at all in two months leading up to them opening the park. And still a lot of people were nervous about being in the crowd. So that would, it's one, you know, it's just a anecdote that might argue that things might come back. So it'll take a little while for people to have some confidence, even with, you know, with the virus uh, being contained. Let's let's go on to a different tack. I mean, at Via Satellite this year, we've uh, feels like we you know we've done a number of big Leo related stories. We did a special edition on on OneWeb, and I know we got some some comments um, from you for that story. Um, where do you stand? I mean, it seems I mean Leo is another one of those topics where everyone has an opinion. Um, what what can work? What 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 doesn't work? Um, what what have you taken out of recent events and how can the industry and even a company like Viasat ultimately potentially make Leo work? Well, uh, I just think for one, I think there's been kind of a mania around Leo's, which I don't really understand. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I don't, it's, it's not really clear to me why they seem so attractive. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's some, Major disadvantage is the biggest one being the geographic distribution of the of the satellites. Yeah. But uh, they they definitely have lower latency. You know, I know that some people some people kind of think that's a really big deal. You know, um, I kind of think you know the the whole reason that latency is such a big deal on the internet is mostly because of design mistakes dating back to the 1960s and 70s. Uh, so if, you know, so it's not so clear that latency is a, should be as critical as it is. And so, you know, one of the things we do is we spend time working around it. But, uh, and, and I think there's a big disadvantage 
in Leo's when it comes to uh, delivering speed and bandwidth per dollar. And I, 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 nothing's really changed on that front. What, what changed for us was you know, the, the rules around some of these subsidies, where if you have a customer and you have to think of you know, the US federal government as through subsidies as a customer, if they're gonna attach many billions of dollars to low latency, what, you know, whether it's important or not, that, that's just what the evaluation criteria is, then obviously we gotta pay attention to that. And so we have, and uh, I think what we've come up with uh, in response to the, the rules on those auctions are very cost efficient for that purpose, which is, you know, kind of the way I put it is, uh, the purpose of subsidies is to motivate industry and business to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do because it's not economical. And so, you know, they spend a lot of money to subsidize, for instance, putting fiber in places that you wouldn't otherwise put it. And so, hey, why wouldn't you subsidize putting satellite in places that you wouldn't otherwise put them in? And it's the exact same analogy. And so uh, I think that if that if it turns out that satellites can compete uh, under that low latency bidding tier, I think we'd be very, very competitive with the system that we, that we uh, applied for. You know, the license modification we submitted. Okay, can you tell us any more what you think that, that, that ultimately could look like? Well, uh, it's a, uh, our approach has, has our spin on it. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, putting satellites in low Earth orbit, it, it, the satellites, each satellite individually is inexpensive, but the number of them collectively is very expensive and you take, it takes a lot of them to be able to get continuous coverage anywhere. So the approach that we took, which is a little bit different than others have, is we really emphasized lots of bandwidth per satellite. So I think the our filing uses technology that we've done uh, on other geosatellites, basically very high capacity per satellite. And then the other thing that we've done is we've made it possible to increase the capacity of each satellite through the ground network. Because the ground network will last a lot longer than the satellites will. And then also to the extent that the ground network is local to where the demand is, that gives you a lot more control of managing the geographic distribution of the demand. So we, have, we would have much less of our bandwidth wasted over areas where there's no demand. So th those are the two big things. And then the other good thing about a Leo constellation is it's inherently, you know, not quite global because ours are in highly inclined orbits, but uh, but it's it's mostly global, you know, within plus or minus sixty-ish degrees of latitude. And so, not only can we use it in the U.S. market, but we can use it globally. And the other big thing that we can do with it is we can use it in a, a combination with our geos to provide both really high speed and low cost of bandwidth plus low latency by combining the two networks. So uh, I think, you know, there, there's, um, in addition to the uh, RDOF application, there's a number of other applications. And we have some ideas about other uh, potential partners who might uh, make it economical for us to do even without the FCC's uh, subsidy. So, so sort of final question. Very much watch watch this space. There's going to be some exciting developments here with Viasat. Yeah, but, but I, you know, I would say don't get. You know, I think people were surprised by us doing a Leo, but I, I would say don't don't get too hung up on that. I think that the things that are really going to be most impactful are just things that we're doing with bandwidth in general across our geo satellites and the, I'd say the main event for us over the next two years or so is going to be getting those new Viasat 3s up, uh, getting those, bringing those into uh, uh, existing applications and new ones and I think we're going to uh, really uh, make, you know, make some good impressions in terms of how much bandwidth we can deliver to people, what speed. I think those are going to be probably more impactful in the total broadband space. Okay. Well, Mark, it's it's a pleasure as always um, to, to talk to you. I know we've done many interviews and we've done fireside chats at events, uh, but it's been a great uh, pleasure to, to talk to you today on some different topics as well as obviously some of the, the Viasat stuff. 
Uh, I wish you and your, your family and your loved ones um, safe health over this period and also wish everybody at, at Viasat all, all the best as well. It's a great company. Um, it's one of the companies we all talk about and it's very much, I think, a standard bearer for, for our industry, does does great work. And, uh, you know, I wish you, uh, wish you and the team all the best. So thank you very much. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate all the nice things you said and, and uh, best luck to you too. Hopefully you can stay safe. Thanks very much. Okay, bye.